Today on Trucks, Stace and I take a Jeep Scrambler and get it ready for the trail by bolting on a hydraulic winch and power steering box. Then we'll take a trip to Reno, Nevada, where 16-time Baja 1000 champion Rod Hall teaches desert racing skills in a Hummer. After that, it's back to the shop for some buffing tips that'll give you professional results without the cost. That's all today on Trucks. Welcome to this week's show, everybody. What you see here is what's fast becoming one of the hottest off-road vehicles on the trail. Now, Jeep called it the CJ8, but it's more affectionately known as the Scrambler. Unfortunately, they only built these things from 81 to 86, and they didn't sell too many of them. But the reason they become so desirable is that they have a longer wheelbase, which makes them very capable off-road. Not to mention, they actually have a bed that you can put something in. Now, when it comes to off-road upgrades, everybody looks to bigger tires, lift kits, and lockers. And believe us, we're going to do all those things to this scrambler, but they won't be near as effective if our steering is a weak link. Now, keep in mind, your stock steering is safe. It's just not designed to turn the big old meats that'll eventually end up on that scrambler. So, we're going to go with AGR Super Box 2. Now, the secret to this box is that it's got a much larger piston than stock. That gives it the ability to handle the most extreme off-road vehicle and still keep it from getting squirrely on the street. Then they top it all off with cadmium plating to prevent rust. Now, this kit also comes with a super pump to run the box, new hoses, a steering shaft with U-joints, as well as a brand new belt and all the hardware you'll need to complete the project. Now, before you disconnect anything from your steering, <laughs> make sure your wheels are pointing straight. I'm going to go ahead and get this air cleaner out of the way so we can see what we're doing. After that, you can disconnect the steering shaft from the column. That's a good idea to mark your steering shaft so if it accidentally gets rotated during the project, you can true it up when you reconnect it. Now that Stace has the steering shaft undone at the column, I can undo the bottom end and pull it out. Now I'm going to tackle the box. The first thing we need to do is pull the pitman on. can unbolt the box from the frame rail. This makes it easier to disconnect the lines and get them up out of the way. Before I can take out the power steering pump, I need to get this air pump out of the way. I'm also going to disconnect the hoses and slide them down to Mel because we're going to replace those too. Once the old pump's out, remove the pulley and put it on the new pump. I took a few extra minutes to clean up the stock bracket before I mounted it to the box. This would also be a good time to hook up your new hoses while you have easy access to the outlets. I'll leave the mess up top for Stace to deal with. Hey, I heard that. <laughs> <laughs> the truth is, Mel didn't really leave me hanging. It's a lot easier to make your connections up here on top once you have your power steering pump bolted in, which I'm going to go ahead and do while uh, Mel struggles with a much heavier and awkward steering box down below. <laughs> Speaking of which, I, I want some help down here, man. <laughs> this is definitely easier if you've got an extra set of hands. Just a little bit. There you go. Okay, you got it. All right, she started. Once the box is bolted in, just reconnect the pitman arm and you're almost done underneath, except for the steering shaft that Stace is prepping right now. When you're measuring your steering shaft, make sure to take into consideration the length of your U joint and then cut accordingly. Now, these U joints come with a set screw, so I've drilled a little indentation for them to seat into. 
After the lower U-joint's connected to the box, Stace can slide the shaft down so I can make the final connection. All we need to do now is hook up the hoses, slap on the new belt, and bolt everything down. AGR's entire system takes about four hours to install, runs about 500 bucks, and believe us, the first time you crank the wheel, you'll know it was money well spent. If we want to keep the wheels rolling around here, we need to pay some bills. Stay with us. Trucks will be back right after this. Up next on Trucks, we'll show you how to pull yourself out of any situation by bolting on a hydraulic winch. Welcome back to the shop. Now that we've upgraded the steering on our scrambler with an AGR system, we're going to put on the most important piece of equipment that you can have if you're going to run the trail. That, my friends, is a winch. We're going to use Mile Marker's two-speed hydraulic winch because of its superior strength and line speed. With hydraulics, you don't have to worry about overheating either. This kit comes complete with all the hoses and hardware you'll need, as well as a fair lead roller and remote control. A mile marker knows that the people that use their winches are definitely serious about off-roading. So, they designed a heavy-duty bumper that'll handle the rigors of winching. This project will only take a few hours to complete. We'll get started by mounting the winch to the new bumper. Which only takes four bolts and an extra pair of hands to keep it from dancing on you. Now that we have the winch mounted to the bumper, I'm going to go ahead and put on this solenoid switch. Got those caps pulled for you, man. All right. That's how she goes, right there. Then I'll mount the elbows. This will give us a chance to decide how we're going to run our lines. Now we can set the new system in place. It bolts right to the existing holes in the frame rail. Oh, that looks great. It sure does, but we're not done yet. We still got some more hookups to do. As we mentioned before, the hydraulic winch runs right off the power steering pump. Now your stock pump is plenty strong to run that winch with the motor just idling. So you know that super pump's really going to make this thing rock. Now the first hookup we'll make is the new hose directly to the power steering pump. Then we'll run the hose down the frame rail, out the front, and into the input on the winch. While Stace is working on the hydraulics, I can mount the input jack for the remote. This looks like the perfect place right here, Stay. Oh, man, that's cool. It's always a good idea to mount these with the hinge on top to help keep stuff from getting in there and interfering with your connection. Now you can make the electrical connections. They only go in one way, so you can't mess it up. Now this winch basically runs in line between the power steering pump and the box. Now we've already made our connection between the pump and the winch, so the last hookup is to go from the winch to the box itself. Now Mile Marker makes a whole bunch of special elbows, so there's no surprises when you hook up to the box. We need to run a hot line from the battery to the solenoid, but the first thing you need to do is mount the circuit breaker. We're going to stick ours right here on the fender. The cool thing about this one is it has a reset switch. Remember, when you run your wires through body panels or around hot radiators, make sure they won't get pinched or burnt. That's good advice, Mel. That's also one of the biggest mistakes that people make when dealing with their hydraulic hoses. Now remember, you've got a steering shaft that's turning here, as well as belts and pulleys that can all damage your hoses if they come in contact with them. It's also a good idea to use wire ties on the lines that go around the frame rail. Don't forget to check your tire clearance. Last thing we have to do is bolt on the Fairlead roller and the hook, and we'll be fully operational. I can't wait. i got to find a place to hook this to. You know, we do have to get it off those risers, man. You know, you're right. I've got the perfect place. This whole system goes for about 1400 bucks, and as you can see, at this point, it's not even trying. And with it being two speed, you can pull slow and low, or you can kick it up to high and really yank something out in a hurry. But we're not going anywhere soon, so hang with us. We'll be right back. That'll do it, man. 
No, it needs to go a little higher. <laughs> Just can't <laughs> resist, can you? Up next on Trucks, we'll take you for the ride of a lifetime with 16-time Baja 1000 champion, Rod Hall. His name is Rod Hall, and he owns the Baja 1000, running every race since the first in 1967 when he paid $1,800 for a brand new CJ5 and wrote the first chapter of what's become an epic novel of adventure and success in the Badlands of Baja. His legacy is built on 16 class championships and includes an overall title in 1969. The record-setting run for this living legend has come from behind the wheel of a Ford Bronco, Dodge Ram, and most recently, the tour de force of off-road vehicles, the Hummer. I was always a person that uh, wanted to win more than I wanted to go fast. So I didn't go any faster than I had to to win a race. But if Roger Mears and I was having a duke out to the finish line the last 50 miles, I mean, believe me, I would drive as hard as I could and take chances and, and uh, misuse my vehicle, but I saved it until I had to do it. When he's not running the competition ragged in the desert of Baja, he returns to Reno, Nevada to share more than 40 years of off-road experience with hundreds of students each year. The opportunity to learn from a master in a Hummer was something Stace and I simply could not resist. The first day out, Rod taught us vehicle placement and clearance before he turned us loose with a feature that's totally unique to the Hummer, brake modulation. Okay, that's good, right there. So the way this works, we're gonna mash on the brake pedal with the left foot. Then we're gonna squeeze on the throttle and override the brake pedal. And once it takes a set and it starts to move, then you don't change anything, and especially on this side hill like this, until you get to the top. Because as soon as you take your foot off the brake, then you lose your traction control system. Start spinning on you. Yes, right. So, let's see what happens. Okay, a little bit that way, and bring it right on up the hill, nice and slow. I think so. Making it look pretty easy, son. Easy. You're making it look easy. How about this man right here? Looking good. Yes, sir. Like butter, Got baby. Her. Just like butter. Catch it on. <laughs> After getting a feel for just how far we could push our stock Hummers, it was time to review day one. Well, the one thing you guys noticed this morning right now is that you don't have to get a lot of momentum going. You don't have to need a lot of speed to make the hill. The Hummer is heavy enough, got lots of tracks and brake modulation. You just kind of ease all the stuff. And I noticed you pull the wheels off the ground a couple of times and you guys did it just right. You dropped it down, just like on a big marshmallow. You don't drop it, crash it, you just, ah. You guys are getting a good feel, quick. With the equipment still in one piece and a head full of knowledge, we dashed home in eager anticipation of day two, a lesson in the race home. The three things you want to keep in mind when you're racing off-road, three basic rules we teach in school. One of them is, are you comfortable in the car? If you're getting a good ride, your speed's probably okay. The next thing is, are you putting the vehicle exactly where you want it? Not almost where you want it, exactly where you want it. And then the third thing is, sometimes ambiguous, are you comfortable behind the wheel? I mean, if you're all tense and worked up, then you're probably driving too hard. Now right now, you see we're getting a comfortable ride, you look relaxed behind the wheel, so uh, I'll tell you, you're doing a fine job for not being, you know, uh, behind the wheel a long time, not having a lot of experience in the desert doing a good job. The hardest thing for people to really get used to is looking far enough down the road so you can anticipate what's going to happen before you get to it. 
and the vehicle placed on the road is just fine, like right there. You know, you kind of moved over to miss that big rock, that's good. You know, why put your tires up if you don't have to? But you're going to hit plenty of rocks anyway so they get there, so let's give it a break. Giving his equipment a break has made Rod Hall the off-road legend he is, but at 61 years old, it doesn't sound like his competition's going to get one anytime soon. Gosh, you know, you got to keep going as long as you can, and then you know, let me tell you guys something. Getting old, it ain't for sissies, and so I figure that I better keep going as long as I can. Up next on Trucks, we've got some simple bumping tips for you that get professional results. Welcome back, everybody. You know, nothing quite adds the finishing touches to your vehicle like chrome or polished aluminum. Problem is, it's expensive to have done, and you're limited to what's available in the aftermarket. Mel and I found these cool valve covers and intake at a swap meet for 50 bucks. Now, if we went to a professional polisher, oh, he'd shine us all right for about 300 bucks. But the truth is, we're too cheap to go that route. <laughs> That's for sure. So we're going to show you how to do it with a couple of kits from the Eastwood Company. This kit is made specifically for intake manifolds and only costs about $60. Comes with all the special compounds, buffs, and grinding rolls for getting into tight little corners. Now, since these valve covers were polished before, I'll get started with a spiral sewn buff and triple E compound. Eastwood's pedestal buffer is great for big pieces like these valve covers, but you can do the same job with a standard bench grinder, and the materials only run about 20 bucks. This compound we're using gives a mild cutting action as well as a good shine, which is known as coloring. This would be a good time to explain the idea behind buffing. What you're basically doing is turning a rough surface into a smooth one using increasingly finer grits. Always buff so the wheels roll off the edge of the workpiece, never into the edge. Move on to your buffing step using these mini buffs and these felt cones for tight corners. I like to start with the Tripoli compound and progress to the White Rouge compound for a brilliant high gloss. As you can see, you don't have to go to a professional to get professional results. And the best part is, once your buddies see what you can do, you'll probably be able to put a few bucks in your pocket as well. Sooner or later, if you dink around with trucks, you're going to have to do some wiring. The problem is, when you solder wire, you really need a third hand, which I personally don't have. So, a slick tip is to take the cap from a can of paint, cut slits in it opposite of each other, and then slide your wire down in there. Now, what this does is hold your connection in place so you can use both hands to solder with. The cap also catches any extra slag that might fall off. That's this week's quick tip. Stay with us. Truck Gear's coming up next. And now Truck Gear. Parts, tools, and equipment for pickups and sport utilities. If you're into off-roading, whether it's desert racing or rock crawling, sooner or later, you're going to have to come up for air. That's why Advanced Air Systems developed the power tank. It fills tires in seconds, runs air tools for more than 20 minutes, and operates your air lockers quicker and quieter than an air compressor. It runs on 10 pounds of liquid CO2 and can be refilled at any welding shop for about 10 bucks. Stay on the trail with the power tank for about $300. Now for those of you building a custom pickup, what could be better than an original set of Raider wheels and the white wall drag flex from the 60s? <laughs> How about a brand new set? Now these wheels are a one-piece polished aluminum that come with a custom center cap and these extra long bullet-shaped lug nuts that just drip with cool. You'll definitely stop people in their tracks with this Raider combo. You off-road guys know there's nothing worse than being stuck with nothing to winch to. The Pull Pal guarantees you'll always have a winch point in mud, snow, or even flat ground thanks to its shovel head design. Best of all, once you're free, it folds up for easy storage in your vehicle. 
Get out of trouble with the Pole Pal for about $250. That's going to do it for this week's truck gear. Let's take a look at what we have for you on next week's show. Stace and I take you step by step through the installation of an air suspension kit on a Ford F-150. After that, we'll turn up the heat and show you some basic tips that'll help you lay down a perfect weld. Then we'll pull up a seat and rebuild a classic carburetor, the Stromberg 97. That's all next week on Trucks. Oh no. Yeah. You cheated. I didn't you cheat. You went on two and a half. Hold on, hold on. Listen, thanks for joining us this week, folks. We'll be back next week. But right now, as you can see, we've got more important things to do. Two, three. Oh, sweet. Oh, <laughs> you pushed that one for us. All right. is an RTM production.